Dear guests, hello and welcome. My name is Alan Dishkrikian and I'm a freshman at the University of California, Los Angeles. Today, Dr. Isabel Castellan Churchill will be presenting her latest publication entitled Sisters of Mercy and Survival, which is a historical study on Armenian nurses before, during, and after the Armenian Genocide. Sisters of Mercy and Survival follows the pioneering work of Armenian women who laid the foundations of modern nursing, midwifery, public health, and the treatment of contagious diseases in the Middle East and the neighboring countries. Born in Hamilton, Ontario, Dr. Isabel received her PhD from the University of Toronto, Canada, and is the Professor Emeritus of the Armenian and Immigration History at the California State University of Fresno. Dr. Isabel has authored, co-authored, and edited several scholarly works, writing on topics such as feminism, women's history, as well as the history of Armenians in Canada. She also wrote the Armenian sections in the Encyclopedia of Canada's Peoples and the New Canadian Encyclopedia. In 2009, she was presented with the Person of the Year Award by the Armenian Fellowship of Canada. After the lecture, there will be a period for questions and answers, and you may ask any questions that you may have. Joining us all the way from Toronto, Canada, please welcome Dr. Isabel Kapten and Church. Opportunity to thank uh, His Holiness uh, Adam Petrodos and the Catholic State Press, and also the Richard and Tina Carolyn Literary Fund for publishing the book. And of course, as a historian, I'm interested in the past. But I'm not an antiquarian, so I'm also interested in the present. So I want to tell you that on Thursday evening, I joined the Armenian American Nurses Association to celebrate their 25th anniversary at their 25th anniversary banquet. And as I was signing the books for the various members, I had a little chat with each member, very short, very brief. Just something to, so that I, I had a little bit of background information about their uh, work and, and their education so that I could write something personal in, the, in, my, in my writing. And I was thinking about this afterwards. And I thought, gosh. Our nurses bring so much wealth to the table. Think of it. They come from different countries, so they bring the cultures of different countries. They had different educational backgrounds, different training, different institutions, different hospitals. And they brought all that, all those traditions with them. Then they had different experiences. We had women who, <coughs> excuse me, women who were directors of nursing in in the United Arab Republic of the uh, Emirates. Sorry. They their education ranged from registered nurses all the way to doctorates. It was wonderful, wonderful to see what our nurses bring, or the wealth that they bring to their work. And their work, of course, is one of commitment and of service. So I think we have a lot to be proud of in our present-day nurses, as well as our nurses of 100 years ago. So today, I'd like to go back 
and talk a little bit about <coughs> the American contributions to Armenia during that very important and difficult decade of the 1920s. Let me start with a few quotations. <clears throat> Hundreds of children, diseased, starving, uncared for, were roaming the streets like little animals. We had to save these children. So night after night, our devoted workers prowled through the markets and searched through the parks, sometimes until midnight. What looked like a bundle of rags wrapped up in an old rug was some tired child, cold, hungry, nearly gone. In this way, American rescuers saved over a thousand children in Yerevan in 1921. Continuing on, Native Near East personnel at Gumri voluntarily cut their food rations in half <coughs> and refunded their salaries since December to assist in meeting the crisis. 10,000 additional orphans must be taken in by the Near East orphanages or starved. 1921. In the same vein, Tikranui Bonapartian, a graduate of Euphrates College, who worked in orphanages in Armenia, wrote about American medical relief workers. I used to be amazed to see American women hugging those vermin-infested Armenian children, dirty and covered with sores. They'd send them off to an orphanage, and day by day, those children improved. I remember hundreds who would have died if they had not received immediate care. <coughs> Dikranui was not the only Armenian impressed by American humanitarianism. Well into the 1920s, this crucial decade for Armenia, American humanitarian humanitarianism saved not just hundreds, but tens of thousands of Armenian lives. This is a copy of one of the posters of the Near East Relief in the United States in trying to raise funds for Armenian and especially Armenian and Greek children. As most of you are aware, the Near East Relief was the most important American humanitarian organization in the post-World War I period. When the Near East arrived in Armenia in 1919, it had many priorities. Among them was the health of children and the training of medical personnel, especially doctors and nurses. In 1920, one of the darkest years of modern Armenian history, with war, famine, starvation, and epidemic ravaging the country, the NER was feeding and providing medical aid to thousands of children. And here we have a photograph of Armenian women washing and trying to clean up Armenian orphan children, many of them suffering from phagus, which was a, uh, a disease of the scalp. You can see all the children that have been, their hair has been shaved, or is being shaved. The Armenian government placed a compound of over 200 buildings, formerly Russian barracks and armories, at the disposal of the NER, all rent free in Gumri. The buildings, badly damaged by the Turkish military, were repaired by the NER and converted to orphanages, hospitals, clinics, schools, and a nurse, and nurse training facility. The NER transferred 20,000 
Armenian orphan children from different locations to Guli, centralizing operations in what came to be known as Orphan City. Here you see a photograph of the children gathering for Sunday morning prayer. Mary Street is the first along there. You can see some of the buildings. Not one of these youngsters was healthy. They suffered from skin infections, eye diseases, intestinal parasites, malaria, tuberculosis, and typhus. To meet this challenge, the NDR set up a number of hospitals. In September, when they moved into Armenia, there were about 10 hospitals in Armenia. It says caucuses, but most of these hospitals were in Armenia. In March, 1920, there were 39 hospitals. Some hospitals were set aside for specific diseases that had reached epidemic proportions, like trachoma, not glaucoma, but trachoma, a contagious eye disease which can lead to blindness. The trachoma hospital in Gumri was famous as the largest children's hospital in the world. We can see some of the, the big buildings in Gumri. One of those buildings was the Tacoma Hospital. And all these Armenian orphan children. At least a third of all the orphans in Gumri had various degrees of trachoma. The American specialist who was in charge of the ophthalmology department organized a system of treating the children's eyes every day so that thousands of Armenian children were saved from blindness. And here we have a doctor. He, first of all, irrigated the eyes, and then each child had a little uh, box with a pencil in it, and they would uh, wipe the eyelid with that pencil. You're, you may have heard about this treatment time and again. Skin disease hospitals were also set up to isolate those suffering particularly from famous scabies and impetigo. Less severe medical cases were treated in clinics. In September 1919, There were only seven clinics in Armenia with an intake of 1,200 a day. 1920, there were 44, with an intake of 4,000 a day. From November 1919 to the end of March 1920, the NER uh, vaccinated approximately 79,000 children for smallpox. And every child on entering an orphanage was inoculated against typhoid fever and cholera. The NER also set up soup kitchens and bread distributing centers in different parts of the country. And milk stations were set up for pregnant women and for children up to the age of about three. In examining the medical contribution of the NER in these hospitals and clinics, the work of the American Medical Corps, composed of volunteer doctors and nurses, was significant. The 
because they were in charge. They were in charge of management, services, teaching, and resources. But the staff, the day-to-day -day workers, was composed entirely of Armenian. But neither Armenian volunteers, sorry, neither American volunteers nor Armenian personnel were enough to meet the humanitarian crisis. The monumental medical demands facing the NER call for the recruitment and training of local Armenian nurses and nurses' aides. So Armenian women and girls were immediately recruited to serve as caregivers and to be trained as nurses. Most of these student nurses were orphans. The link between nursing and orphans had already been established before World War I, but it became now entrenched because of the increase in the number of orphans and the crushing demand for nurses. The girls had to be 17 years or older with a middle school education and with some practical experience. They had to be morally upright, intelligent, and dedicated to helping others. As for training, many young American nurses volunteered through the American Red Cross to serve in Armenia. Among them was Edith Winchester, who arrived in Armenia in 1919, full of hope and idealism. But four months after her arrival, Young Edith died of typhus. Her companions were heartbroken. When the NER and the American Red Cross established a training school for nurses in Gumri, they named it the Edith Winchester School of Nursing. In 1921, a group of 28 Armenian orphan girls were recruited as student nurses for the three-year program. They formed the beginning of the Winchester Training School for Nurses and helped lay the foundations of professional, modern nursing in Armenia. They were the first of hundreds to attend and graduate from the Winchester School. And here we have one of the first groups of Armenian students in Gumri. American Red Cross nursing instructors used American methods and standards to teach and train Armenian girls. And most important of all, they used American nursing curriculum modified to suit local needs and conditions. As a base, they taught anatomy, physiology, and bedside nursing. And here's a precious photograph of an, of an American nurse instructor and Armenian student nurses. Beyond this, the Winchester School responded to the malaria epidemic by offering special training in the prevention and care of tropical diseases. You can imagine there was a problem of language. The American girls, nurses, did not know Armenian and the Armenian student nurses knew very little, if any, English. So the NER hired translators. And here we have a photograph of an NER nurse, or Red Cross nurse actually, teaching the Armenian students, and there we have the Armenian translator. To meet the need for up-to-date texts, the NER had American nursing texts translated into Armenian. The NER also gave classes in arithmetic and reading and writing Armenian and speaking, reading, and writing English. So there was a broad spectrum of courses. But one of the most serious problems in Armenia was the high maternal and infant mortality rate. 
A major factor contributing to this high death rate was a refusal of Armenian women to have male gynecologists treat them and deliver their babies. They insisted on using the native midwife. So Americans made a special effort, as they had before World War I, to train Armenian women as midwives, and by doing so, managed to lower the death rates of pregnant and birthing women and newborns and infants. Nursing, of course, went beyond hospital work, since every region of Armenia was desperate for medical aid. Hospitals and orphanages were primary centers of medical treatment, but these were located largely in urban centers. The need for medical care and basic sanitation, hygiene, and diet education in rural areas in Armenia was acute, but providing medical services in the countryside provided huge challenges. Such problems were partially dealt with through health education in the schools. To facilitate such a program, the NER had a 170-page textbook entitled Hygiene, published in Armenian. By the end of 1926, 3,000 copies had been printed. Wouldn't we like to get our hands on, on that one? The Winchester School trained nurses and nurses' aid in public health. The nurses traveled to outlying villages in health wagons or mobile clinics. And here you can see the young nurse in her cart, and it's being driven by a young refugee boy. And she's going to go off into some distant place and try to bring help. So these graduates from the Winchester School directed a campaign against malaria, for example. And one of them did so in 14 villages, and she describes her work. And here's what she says. We are short of clean water and are using river water cleaned by a stone filter. <clears throat> At present, we have a scarlet fever epidemic. In just one week, we have opened a 12-bed hospital to isolate the children. There have been very few fatal cases. On Sundays, we are practicing preventive medicine. We kill the mosquitoes, inspect the farms, spray sulfur in stables, dry the marshes, and put kerosene on the stagnant water. Another nurse describes how she and her team visited 36 villages in 27 days and they gave medical aid to 250 children, of whom 150 were afflict afflicted with malaria, 25 with eye diseases, 45 with throat problems, 20 with stomach problems, and 10 with phagus. Under the leadership of the NER, this program eventually developed into a government-sponsored public health service for the rural community. And I want to make a point here. I want to stress something. This was public health in the 1920s in Armenia, in some of the far out isolated places. And it was far ahead of many of the industrialized countries. Never even thought of public health, let alone had an institution where whereby they were bringing public health into the distant areas. The Winchester School started out as a response to an emergency, but it soon developed into a full-scale school of nursing. Its graduates, its program, and its curriculum was recognized by the International Council of Nurses. The graduates from the Winchester School served in government hospitals and clinics in public health programs 
at the Institute for Tropical Diseases in Yerevan, or as guardians of the emergency brigades, the rudimentary ambulance service, or ambulettes. And here you see the nurses on their little wagon taking, um, attending, going somewhere where there is an emergency. This is probably in Yerevan. The Winchester graduates were the pioneers of Nightingale style nursing in Soviet Armenia. And I thought it was interesting that one of our nurses who went to Armenia and after the uh, uh, earthquake told me on Thursday that when they got there, they found that the, the nursing program was all based on the military military nursing. So they had, of course, that was 100 years ago, and they had certainly digressed away from the American program by that time. Let me say something about nursing as a profession. In the pre-war period, nursing had been condemned among Armenians as inappropriate work for respectable girls. After the war, however, Nursing achieved a new status in the eyes of survivors. Armenian nurses were now serving sick and wounded Armenian soldiers, thousands of helpless orphans on the verge of death, and a frail refugee population suffering from severe epidemics. A nurse friend of mine who read the book told me that her father had been in the Harper Hospital, American Hospital in Harper, and he had had a, a leg infection, and the Turkish doctor wanted to amputate. And an Armenian nurse said, no, 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 I will take care of this boy. I personally must, will take care of this child. And she did, and she actually saved that child's life and his leg. The dedication of nurses and the dependence of many survivors on their care changed the general attitude toward nursing. Survivors understood that in the hands of doctors and nurses, in their skills and in their compassion, lay the survival of the Armenian nation. Humanitarianism became bound up with patriotism. Now let me say something about the American legacy. American medical relief workers disseminated Western medical science in Armenia. They imported their medical practices, administrative procedures, and technology into the depths of the country. They trained and educated Armenian young people in American medical traditions. Despite tensions between Moscow and Western governments, the broad American-sponsored assistance in Armenia was welcome at the local level. And this included large-scale agricultural and industrial development in addition to the medical work. I would love to have gone into the agricultural and industrial uh, issues in this book, but obviously I had my hands were tied with the, the medical work was enough. This raises a very interesting perspective on the relationship between Americans and Armenians. If we look at the bigger picture over a longer period of time, we see that the work of the NER had a precedent in the region. Before World War I, American Protestant missionaries in Turkey were able to thrive because of the Armenians. It's true, the Protestant missionaries had built churches, but the Armenians had actually built those churches. They had contributed to those churches. They had contributed in kind to those churches. The clergy, mostly, uh, no, I shouldn't say mostly, the clergy, in
included many Armenians, and certainly most of the parishioners of those churches were Armenians. The same applies to schools and colleges. Armenians helped build those schools and colleges. Armenian teachers taught in those schools and colleges, and most of the students were Armenian. If you look at Euphrates College, for example, the language of instruction was even Armenian. And the same applies to the hospitals. The Armenians helped build those hospitals. Money was collected here in the United States, as well as over there, for those hospitals. And Armenian doctors were practicing in those hospitals. And Armenian nurses, most of the nurses were Armenian. And certainly all the pharmacists were Armenian. And a vast majority of the patients were Armenian. So the American missionaries were successful in their work in the Ottoman Empire through their relationship with the Armenian minority. This relationship between Armenians and Americans, missionaries and relief workers, reflects the penetration of the United States into Asia Minor and the Caucasus. The missionaries before World War I and the relief workers in the 1920s were the flag bearers of an American presence in the region, and the Armenians were part of that dynamic. But history had other plans for the Armenians. First, the mandate for Armenia was turned down in the American Congress. And then in 1930, in the depths of the Depression, the NER ended its activities, closed shop in Armenia and elsewhere, and went home. And at the same time, the Russian Soviets asserted greater control in the strategic land of the Caucasus. Without the mandate, American influence waned. History changed course. But I wonder. This relationship between Armenians and Americans was hated by the Turks. In my research, I came across two newspaper clippings dated May 1921 from Kharkiv in which the Turks accused the Americans of coming to Turkey not for the sake of humanity, but for the sake of the cross and the Protestant creed. The Turks accused the Americans of trying to establish a Christian foothold in Turkey in order to destroy Islam so that Christianity would face no obstacles in spreading throughout Asia. The Americans, the article said, were spreading poison in the land and were using the Armenians as faithful servants to bring them forth as Protestant knights to build a Christian empire in the East. Let's recapitulate for a few minutes. Initially, the Armenians were accused of being enemy agents of the Russians. And this liaison with the Russians was used as justification for the genocide. That's why, that's why they destroyed our, our properties, or confiscated our properties, destroyed our churches, abducted our women and children, killed our men and boys. Then after the destruction and devastation, Armenians were accused of being foreign agents of the Americans. That was almost 100 years ago. Let's move fast forward. Recently, I read an article by Tamar Akcham, a Turkish historian, about the current history textbooks in Turkey, prepared by the Ministry of Education or approved by the Ministry. In these texts, Armenians are consistently portrayed as enemy agents, 
easily incited by foreign powers. The Armenian matter, that is to say, Armenian mobilization on the genocide centenary, is defined as the biggest current threat to Turkish national security, right next to the historical threat of the missionaries and their activities. That is what youngsters are being taught in Turkey today, including in the Armenian schools. So you can see a direct line from events in the early 20th century to Erdogan's current policy to distance Turkey from the United States and to embrace imperial Ottomanism and pan-Turkism. 